uh, uh, it's one, two, three new members, as far as I can see here. Steve Levesque, Hans Bergman, and Les Frost. I, I seem to understand that they might be on this, uh, this uh, Zoom call, uh, but uh, if Tom Devi is on the call at the moment, please make sure that uh, you add them, get in contact with them through Paul Sonicson. Uh, make sure you uh, get their information and get them on the uh, distribution list for the club. That's what we'll really do. That. We have three new members. I will do that. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. And then, if any of those people uh, have information, uh, for example, uh, name, email, address, phone number, you can always contact Tom at Tom DB. That's T O M D E V E Y at gmail.com. Once again, great newsletter there, Gary. Uh, very impressive. And uh, thank, you. I thank you for all the people who participated in, uh, in that, the, the creation of that letter. Uh, people who are interested, we do have a March, May, September, November timeframe where newsletters are being uh, created by Gary. So uh, please do, if you have any interesting collections that uh, you'd like to share, if you have any interesting skills or tools, even layouts for your uh, workshop, uh, please uh, consider contacting Gary and uh, pulling that together for uh, a newsletter. And uh, we keep co weekly coffee club. Once again, Paul is on Tuesdays at one o'clock conducting his weekly co uh, coffee club and it, uh, or coffee clutch. And it seems to be working out very well. About nine-ish people on average are showing up for that. And they're talking about uh, doing some training sessions, online training sessions. So if you're interested, I think he sent out uh, an email or two to the club membership. Please get back to Paul if you're interested in any of those uh, training videos. Just to confuse everybody. Can you hear me, Don? Yeah. I was just going to introduce myself, not as Don Purchase, as listed on the page, but Paul Sonics. We get our change the name on this. Depends on who logs in first, they get the uh, claim names. Yeah. I tried to change it, but I can't. Okay, that's probably because I'm already logged on. Maybe you've been hanging out with Don too long. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're we're merging. Um, <laughs> in 2022, like depending on how Omicron does and such, we're interested in uh, conducting a a booth or having a, a booth at one of the fairs, the Carp Fair, the Richmond Fair, the Osgood Fair, and. Um, John DeLand is, uh, and, and myself and Paul Devey are the, the three people who have uh, uh, voiced interest in participating in that. It takes many, uh, many people to uh, make things run smoothly and easily. So please, if you could volunteer to man the booth, to participate in the booth, uh, please contact uh, any of us, Paul Devey, John DeLand and myself, uh, basically, you know, there's the setup and tear down. Setup is usually on a Friday. Tear down will be on on the Sunday, and then manning the booth. Basically, we we have a number of clocks in the booth. With we have signs on boards around the booth, which uh, the boards and signs are already there. Uh, donations for clocks that make uh, sort of eye candy for people to come by and say, "Oh, that's interesting," and then uh, and then we basically just talk to people to come by. And uh, we have, uh, Gary has prepared a, 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 a pamphlet and we're going to have those printed out. And so we can start handing out pamphlets at these, uh, at these events so that we can uh, increase membership and uh, just sort of uh, advertising for the club. So yeah, there, there's nothing ominous or scary about the uh, Carp Fair or the Richmond Fair and having the booth there. It's basically just standing around and talking with folks and giving them information that they, uh, they ask about. Also in 2012, 
John Deland is uh, uh, is uh, working on uh, planning for a club outing. The club outing would be something that would be financially uh, uh, augmented, supported by the club. And, it, and so we're trying to figure out what those options could be and what people would be interested in as an outing. If you have any ideas, please contact any of the executive and uh, share your ideas with us. We'll make sure that we uh, pass them on to John. And uh, th that way we can make sure that there's lots of cool ideas for an outing for 2022, all depending, of course, on Omicron. Um, yeah, uh, Gary, did you want to talk about the brochure at all? He said to himself. I guess not. So Gary has the uh, the, the yeah. brochure. Okay. For some reason, I'm not showing up here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. And we can see you as well. Okay, my screen has gone blank here. Um, the uh, brochure is something that basically you can see here. It's a trifold with 80-pound um, glossy paper. And it describes on the front uh, our chapter of who we are in very general terms. And um, it gives contacts for our website, et cetera, uh, Facebook page and, and uh, uh, email access to our secretary. And on the last page, it talks about the National Association. Then on the other side, um, there's a complete description of the benefits of being a member of the club. And then they talk, we talk a little bit about clocks and watches and what you can expect to find at a meeting uh, with respect to that. The fact that there's um, presentations, technical, historical, etc. There's marts with all sorts of goodies and so on. It, uh, it, it tries to be as thorough as possible. The executive had a look at it and made a number of uh, changes. And we now have 300 copies in a box there. So that's basically it. Thank you very much. Um, with regards to training, uh, Paul is working on uh, coordinating some online uh, Zoom training sessions. So get in contact with Paul uh, with regards to that. With regards to our usual picnic, because of Omicron and such, we'll have to wait and see about that one. Same thing with the wine and cheese in the Good old days, we used to have a, a fall wine and cheese uh, evening. And once again, we'll, we'll wait and see about that one. We'll keep on using Zoom as we are right now to uh, host our, our meetings and training sessions. Uh, with regards to the website, we want to make sure and invite people to actually use the website and uh, post things on the website. And if there's somebody who has some web background or some experience who wants to learn, one of the things we're trying to do is uh, make sure that uh, we can dynamically update content on the website ourselves. And so if somebody's interested in uh, participating or working on that, that would be fun, uh, fun and fine. And uh, please get in contact with any one of uh, the executive to, uh, to volunteer. <coughs> any comments from the membership? Any membership comments? <laughs> hey Don, uh, I like the, uh, on, on the training, I like the uh, videos that have been posted to uh, YouTube uh, in the last couple of weeks. Excellent, yeah. Yeah, as, as I understand some of those, uh, the YouTube site is where we have been actually Posting our uh, video, I didn't realize we were doing it that way, and so that's that's good to know. You look like Captain Kirk, there, Paul. I feel like Captain Kirk. Well, more like Captain Crunch. <laughs> <laughs> too many cavities for that one. 
any other comments or questions from people in the uh, membership in general before we continue? Don, I was just wondering, do you have any feeling for when we might be able to meet in person? Do you think, uh, do you expect anything before the fall? Well, there's a question, eh? Um, I think that we, we're at the uh, beck and call of the City of Ottawa and when they can open up the uh, meeting rooms for, for the membership. Now, if they can open up the meeting room, that's good. But uh, it all depends on how many people can get in the meeting room because there could be a limit, you know, half, half capacity, that sort of a thing. Um, and so we will uh, keep you in the loop with regards to that so that we can actually coordinate the face-to-face uh, -face again. Uh, we could in the fall or at some time in the year, probably September-ish timeframe, have another uh, March and face-to-face, -face. could do it on the property here again like we did last year so that people could you know, socially distance outside and then also have uh, a March and just some some face-to-face -face time um, and, and chat that way. So that that's another option. Always. And then Tom, there's your house. So, I mean, that's another option that we can work on too. Um, also, I was wondering, uh, is there any intent to perhaps carry on Zoom, the Zoom part of the meeting in future uh, future meetings? Or would yes. that be a bit difficult? That, that, uh, that's a good question. And we're, we've uh, decided that, yeah, for sure, we're going to continue on with the Zoom meetings. We've uh, signed up for another year. For, for Zoom, so we have the contract for another year. And uh, that would include things like the meetings like this, as well as the coffee clutches, as well as training sessions that people want to uh, put on. Uh, that will continue for the year, uh, for sure. Now, afterwards, if and whenever we can do face-to-face -face meetings, we still want to record the meetings and, uh, on Zoom so for people who cannot make it, or for people, we have members now that are in the Maritimes, for example, so people who cannot make it, they can always attend by the Zoom meetings, and then we'll post the uh, key important things of the Zoom meetings on our website. So I think Zoom is gonna be a continued uh, use throughout uh, the future, or in the future, and uh, that's good. And then the video equipment, you stole uh, my next item, is that we have uh, uh, members of the coffee clutch uh, have been talking about that, and we'll be doing things like uh, researching what video equipment we could we could uh, purchase to do things like uh, properly recording the meetings, but also doing zoom in, you know, getting into the very fine details of a clock watch movement and uh, being able to show those on screen. So that's something that we uh, will be looking into this year to purchase equipment for the club so we can uh, continue with the online as well as even if we're in face-to-face, uh, -face, we can zoom in and then project it on a screen behind us so you can see what that person at the front of the room is doing. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Question. Question, sir. Yes. Okay, the question is, is there a link on our site that will take you to videos that are on YouTube now? Yes. Yes, there is. You just have to click on the link that's in the website and it's not on the website, it'll take you right to YouTube. The page is actually headed with uh, become a subscribe to our YouTube channel. Oh, you don't okay. Have to, you can still see it without subscribing. Oh, okay. I'm uh, I'm having internet issues here, so I'm getting most of everything that's said, but I'm not always getting it all. Thank you. Not a problem. And just to keep you up to date, there, Gary or Paul, or for the numbers we have, twenty-eight at the moment. I'll let you know right. what the. Uh, maximum is by the time we uh, get to the maximum. And let's see, so our website, the wine and cheese, uh, this is a year of uh, the election. So in the September timeframe, uh, or even earlier, we'll be uh, 
asking people to identify their interest in running for a position for the executive. Um, the executives of uh, your existing executives have been in their positions for uh, quite a few years, uh, six to nine years, if not more. Uh, so, it, you know, sometimes it's a good idea to have some fresh blood, fresh ideas and uh, get more involved in your club. So please do uh, consider uh, one of these positions for the executives. We'll let you know which ones are opening up uh, for, uh, for, for voting upon and, and, and presenting yourself for, and then which ones people uh, will consider uh, continuing on and maybe other people could still volunteer and then we could vote for that uh, who would fill up that position again anyways. So please do that. Do consider that. At the moment, we are working our way towards the presentation, the House of Wonders. But before we get there, um, I just wanted to uh, let you know I had this very uh, nice potential uh, opportunity for a uh, presentation at uh, more in the fall, September probably time frame. Oh, is that Dan Hudon I see there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Dan. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> We're all saying go, that. <laughs> Good yeah. to see you, Dan. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, we, uh, yeah, now I'm off my tack track. <laughs> uh, we, I, I contacted a, 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 a number of people it, it, over the last year for participating in the clock club meeting. And uh, one of them was the uh, architects for Big Ben and uh, finding out if there was any of the engineers that worked for Big Ben. And then also the curators for the British uh, Royal Household. And the one who got back to me at up to now is the curator, the, the, not the curator, the senior curator for the British household um, would be interested in presenting to the club. And so more in the later in the year. And so I'm going to negotiate with them. I'm not sure because there's a five hour difference between us and them. And so if, if he presents in three o'clock in the afternoon, it'll be 10 o'clock our time. So it's kind of hard to coordinate with him. So what we might do is uh, have a presentation at his convenience. Uh, I would, uh, if, if we can coordinate this, I'll ask everybody if they have questions, if you can't attend the meeting, if you have questions for them, we'll consolidate the questions and whoever can attend the live meeting will record it. And then that way, uh, people who can see the live meeting can see the live meeting people who cannot see the live meeting will show it again on our next club meeting. So that way you get uh, up to two chances, not just one, but two, two chances at the senior curator for the, uh, the, the Royal household. So that'll be a very interesting possibility. And I'll let, I'll keep you in the loop with regards to that, uh, to, to see how that rolls out. Yeah, uh, Donna, the Royal Collection. What's that? It's the Royal Collection. The Royal Collection, not the Royal Household. Well, the Royal, yes, the Royal Collection. Well, he, yes. No, he does the entire household. He cleans the windows and everything. <laughs> no, the Royal Collection, yes. Yeah, but the, the, the Royal Collection is spread, spread around, you know, around through the different uh, facilities. But yep. the Royal Collection is, is not only clock, but also paintings and works of art. Yeah, but he works on the clocks part. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that'll be very interesting to see how that goes. So that was the movie. I apologize for the uh, various interruptions. I'm not quite sure what was happening there. Um, a couple of things. Um, the movie was dated 1931, and the only way they could come up with that particular um, uh, dating was from the watches that you saw at the end of the movie. The other thing, um, when I visited Elgin 
several years ago uh, as part of my research, the only building left standing is the, um, the observatory that you saw, and it's now been transformed into a planetarium. And there was sort of a, a railway um, trackside building that couldn't have been much more than 10 by 10 that was still sitting out in the middle of nowhere in the general area where they used to have um, uh, supplies brought in. Uh, other than that, the, uh, the factory building is gone, um, torn down. Uh, there's a huge casino there now, and the uh, watch school is also gone. Very interesting, actually. I uh, I love seeing the uh, white shirts and the vests and the ties when people are in a manufacturing environment. It's uh, it really shows how things you know, the, uh, the the clothes ethics I think have have changed over time. But also, it's nice to see the men and the women working in there, and it was uh, beautiful to see that. Any comments from anybody in uh, in in the club? Uh, you were struck by how many women were working there, which is really nice to see. I remember uh, Dan Houdon put on a presentation a couple of years ago about uh, one of the watch factories and and the problems that the factory had in housing all of the people that moved into the town to uh, to support the operation. And when you saw the number of people going into the factory and leaving at the end of the day, it's, uh, I'm sure that Elgin had the same problems that Dan uh, was talking about in his presentation. <coughs> I found it amusing that they let uh, the ladies uh, three minutes ahead of the guys. But with that kind of volume, they'd just get stampeded anyways. <laughs> there was a... Uh, uh, they did really well with um, doing the graphics for, for explaining the different parts of the machines and what the machines were doing, like whenever they were showing where the jewels were being set. That, that was really, uh, for 1931, I thought that was, that was quite cool. I, I wondered um, how um, smaller watch companies could uh, possibly complete with a place like this. The, the volume, like making each individual part from steel and brass. Um, you know, there were other railroad watches, for instance, with uh, lesser known um, uh, companies like Huber and whatnot. Uh, how could they possibly um, compete with Elgin or were they buying Elgin parts and manufacturing their own watches? <clears throat> couldn't, couldn't answer that. Uh, that I mean, it, there are so many companies that um, opened up and failed because of the costs associated with building all of the equipment that they needed. There weren't a lot of uh, suppliers out there ready to provide the industrial level equipment. Certainly there was equipment for the individual watchmaker at the bench, but not this kind of stuff. Well, I think the way that it was done before in Coventry was to have many individual manufacturers making different parts. So one company made dials, another company made jewels, another company made shafts, you know, there were hundreds of them, uh, all making different bits. And then the bigger companies, the actual watch producers would buy them and stick them together and then have a watch finisher make them work. That was largely the English and the Swiss or the European method. They in the States, the, the factories were pretty much self-sufficient. This It looked like this factory uh, operated very similar to uh, uh, Ford's uh, Rouge River plant in Detroit, where they made everything for the, uh, for the cars. Basically, raw materials came in to, do, to, to, to manufacture and then to assemble. That's quite impressive. And when you look at the size of the building, Elgin, Illinois is small, and that factory is huge. 
a factory town. Yeah. That was pretty impressive, uh, the scale. I, I, what I found amazing when I first saw the film was just the level of mechanization and the, um, the intricacies of, of those machines. It, it, it's not something I expected from the 1930s, but then, I don't know. It, yeah. um, Standardization had started by uh, then because of the Ford factory type of uh, environment. The one that thing that really uh, impressed me was that one woman who was doing the some finishing work, and it was obviously some scroll work that would go on the face of uh, or a plate. And you saw her have a big template, and she just moved her uh, pencil thing around the template, and the mechanized technique scaled it down to watch size and they were doing like what 10 20 50 watches at the same time so it's that mechanization that just the ingenuity of being able to do that and getting it uh, to, to work so efficiently is uh, just amazing well it's also interesting what uh, where you make the distinction of where do you incorporate uh you know, the human element and, 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 and machines. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to me that uh, an industry that was that big and that successful just kind of vanished and disappeared and sort of totally tanked in pretty short order after, I guess, right after World War II, just vanished, you know, way before quartz was invented, the, American watch industry just kind of disappeared. I'm uh, looking at on uh, uh, Wikipedia, the Elgin National Watch Company Observatory, which is uh, uh, an element there. And um, they state that the Great Depression hit the Elgin National Watch Company badly. Following World War II, Swiss manufacturers began to dominate the pocket watch industry. The final blow came in 1950 when the United States Time Corporation introduced a cheap wristwatch that could be discarded and repurchased for the less than the cost of repair. The Elgin National Watch Company ceased watch production in the late 1950s. I believe the plant was shut down in 1960 and demolished in 1966. Talking. One of the, uh, the, the whole contraction of that particular company because of the competition from the Swiss and from the uh, cheap dollar watches, um, they actually closed that factory and had another smaller facility in another state and it closed down afterwards too. That it was, um, you saw in that image of the, um, of, of the factory building, the large clock tower, well, all the newspapers, when they tore down the building, they had this shot of the tower collapsing to the ground as the wrecking ball took it out. I, think with the standard I put a copy uh, or a link, uh, a link of the uh, YouTube video uh, over in the chat if anybody wants to uh, take a look at that again. And uh, that was a great video, Gary. I enjoyed that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I apologize for these. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering if it is uh, available on YouTube, then maybe what we could do is put a link to it on, uh, on, the, on the video. And then that way people could, uh, who want to look at the, the video, could look at the uh, link and look at the movie just on via YouTube. Okay, show and tell. If uh, whoever wants to or has anything to show and tell, you can unmute yourself and uh, and talk about what you have to share. <laughs> Don't all jump in at once. <laughs> I should say that I'm not actually Bonnie's toy. That's what my wife called her laptop computer. Mine doesn't have a microphone, so I'm using hers. My name's Les Frost, and uh, I'm just, in essence, joining your group as I plan to try and fix up some pocket watches. Other than that, I'm going to be staying quiet because I really don't know anything yet. Uh, 
Well, welcome to the cloud, Lars. Yeah. So, so is, your wife name, is your wife's like, name Bonnie or Toy? <laughs> I, I'd like to ask uh, Alan Simmons if there's been any new additions to the museum recently, or is he working on anything? He'll have to unmute himself. Right. <laughs> Occasionally finding things. I've actually started a personal collection of Harry Snyder's 1950s clocks. I've got four at home, but uh, just for fun, this one turned up on the Miller and Miller auction. And this is um, Albert Paganal, one of Arthur's brothers. As most of you know, Arthur and his many brothers had watch and jewelry shops all over Western Ontario. And this is one that was from Brantford. And I won't mention the price because it was a bit crazy. And if I can't get it open without losing a finger, anyhow, it's the uh, fake silver. Get that set up there. With uh, his initials on the dial as watch companies, or sorry, watch shops did a long time ago, uh, putting their own advertising right on the dial of the watches they sold. So it's a large, I guess you would call 18 size pocket watch with the fake silver. And Gary can give you a little more background if he's listening on the, uh, the uh, type of material that was used. It was much cheaper than, than silver, but it looked a bit like silver. It's a, it's a nickel case so-called nickel silver and what there were some classic uh, words for that type of watch as well like the case that is so there were brown uh brand names like silver road and silverine and so on yeah uh, they and, actually Duber and a lot of other companies actually put these together with uh, with the cases yes so that's the only item i continue to watch uh, even on uh, Facebook Marketplace now, that's the fourth one, including and many of you know about Kijiji and eBay and even Etsy, but um, nobody's been putting up much in the way of Snyder clocks in the last two or three months, fortunately. Anybody else? <clears throat> Yeah, JD here, if you're interested. Sure. Just trying have to start to, with it. have to turn your screen on, though. Yeah, I've got, I was trying to get my smaller camera here and plug it in, and turn it on. So I've got my bigger camera. I was trying to focus in on the smaller one. So let me see if I can get a different one on here. Well, the problem I have is I'm, I got to turn another vi uh, application off. Yeah, okay. It's hogging the camera. So Dan Hudon, as you can see, things have really evolved with the Clock Club in terms of having these uh, uh, Zoom meetings. So it's uh, really been a bonus for the uh, COVID years to be able to have meetings like this. So it's good to good to see you uh, online again. Yeah, you'll have to unmute yourself. There's a, uh, if you move your mouse towards the bottom, you can actually uh, click uh, on the left, bottom left. You'll see a little microphone. Okay. There can you go. hear me now? Yep. All right. All right. Yeah, I, 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 it's great for me to be able to uh, participate this way uh, because, because of my condition, I don't get out much and I'm not allowed to actually go out where there are crowds. I'm still told that I'm uh, immunocompromised. So therefore I uh, have to watch out where I go. Exactly. So I, this is a good way to participate for me. Perfect, well, you're, you've been well missed and uh, good to see you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like to say that when we have our coffee clutches, your name comes up almost every meeting, Dan. You uh, certainly train many of us uh, in clock. Whenever we have a problem, and there's a disagreement, we say, well, Dan told us to do it this way. Uh, well, then you must be doing it right. 
Yeah, so on two on Tuesdays at one o'clock, you should join in on the coffee club, uh, coffee club clutch, coffee clutch club. <laughs> yeah. I'll try there's, no, there's no fear of infection on that uh, coffee clutch. Yeah. All right. <laughs> you get infected by buying too many watches and tools. Yeah. I've got a, a something here. Can I speak? Is it okay? Okay, so this, I picked this watch up actually from doing a repair uh, of a Rolex for this lady and she didn't have much money. So she gave me her grandfather's stuff. There wasn't a lot in there, but I, but this was kind of neat. It was a, uh, it says on the face that it's a uh, W.L. Whalen, Sault Ste. Marie, Canada. If I can zoom in on this, you can see that. Can you get that full screen for us, please? I, you're going to have to full screen it on your side, I think. Got a good clear view here. I assume Don Purchase always did that for us, but I don't know. I'm green on that. If you hit, if you right click or you hit the little double, the dots in the corner there, and then you hit pin, then then my thing will show up, I think. If you hit on my double dots, maybe. I don't know. Is it full screen for anybody? Yeah, it is for me. So if you're on the top right, you'll see a little thing says view. And then click on speaker. And then whoever's speaking, it'll take up a major part of your screen. Yeah. Okay. And it looks like it's working too. All right. So what I thought, so I actually repaired this and got it working again. And, um, and what I thought was kind of cool about it is that when I cracked it open, it's a size 18. This thing is a beast. You can see how thick that is. This, uh, this is a normal, this would be a size 12 pocket watch next to it. And that's an 18. So this is a monster. This would be a banker's pocket watch, for example. Um, and when I opened it up, I've polished it as well. So I went and down to the buffing wheel and I buffed the crap out of it. But when I opened it up, I realized, hey, this is an Omega watch. So it's a, if you look in there, see if I can get, I got a light on my camera so I can turn a light on here too, I think. Staying on. These technical difficulties are felt by everybody, right? So there we go. There you go. All right. So that is an Omega, if you can see that. I'm not sure if it's inverted or not, but it's an Omega. It's an Omega watch, Swiss, seven jewels. So it's not a high-end watch, uh, adjusted to two positions. So, so what I'm thinking, and I know a lot of jewelers did this back in the day, right? I'm missing a screw I got to put in here, but I got this thing going again. It was in pretty tethered condition or tethered, tethered condition. And what I'm thinking is that uh, this jeweler basically ordered the movement from Switzerland. He had the face, the face made for himself. Right, so he had basically advertising his little jewelry store, so Whalen Jewelers, and um, it actually, you know, I looked it up, um, it comes from uh, Winnipeg, so the jeweler was in Winnipeg, which is kind of neat when you look at the history of watches, and the case is a silveroid case, and it is, I believe, uh, Philadelphia, yeah, Philadelphia Watch Case Company. So the case came from Philadelphia, the movement came from Switzerland, and the face came from who knows where. <laughs> Canada somewhere, maybe. So that was my, my one thing. And then the last thing I want to show you is this tool I picked up for anybody who likes tools. So this tool is about the size of, there's a set of glasses next to it. So it's this size. And it's got a spring here. And that spring opens this little mouth here. There's a jaw here. And there's a screw holding us in, and there's two studs aligning this, and there's three legs on the bottom, like that. And I wasn't, I saw this on eBay and I wasn't gonna buy it. I was like, I was just saying, no, no, this is like, I gotta stop buying tools. So I was not gonna buy this. And then I was going through my book, which is the uh, uh, watch, uh, bench practices for watch repairs. I just had to look at my library there. So bench practices for watch repairs. And didn't they have a picture of this in the book? I'm like, oh my God, now I got to buy it. It's actually a tool. It isn't something that somebody made. So this is actually for holding hairspring studs. 
So if you've got a hairspring and you're working on it, you would you would basically pin the stud. Let me grab a hairspring here. Got a hairspring here. You would this would flip around the other way, and you'd be you'd grab the stud with this pincher. That's as far as I know about this tool, but I thought it was kind of cool for people that uh, enjoy tools. And that's it. Any comments? I, I enjoyed the uh, the whale and watch. I bought a uh, a big clunker like that from Gary Fox at the uh, summer meeting um, at uh, Don's place for uh, ten dollars. Uh, I tried and tried various sources. I couldn't identify a whale and uh, jeweler or or anything. So I'm pleased you narrowed it down to Sault Ste. Marie. I haven't yeah. got mine open yet, and no, it doesn't run. But uh, um, that was a nice follow-up. Thanks. And there's what must be the brother. That's an Illinois around the same size. And it's a monster as well. And that's a key wound, which I've I've just repaired. So anyway, we got this one running again too. That's it. Yeah, this is a pretty cool watch. I'm probably never gonna get rid of this one. You have to look like they're nicely polished too. Yeah, I'm really anal retentive. Eh? When I get a watch or something, I can't let it go until it's looking really good. So unless it's unless it, the the customer wants me to leave it vintage, and I usually ask them because sometimes they want it to look really bad. Um, but I was working <laughs> on a watch recently, and I still have to, I got to make a balance staff for this, and this looked like crap. All the plates were corroded. It just looked awful. So I, I went went at it with, and maybe you'll, you can appreciate this. I went at it with a Bergeron uh, glass brush. I'll show you what it looks like. Ill prepared here. So I, I use this here, the Bergeron uh, 6240. If you want to get a brush that's really good to get rid of corrosion, and it has probably not cheap, it's like a pencil. And then there's fiberglass on the end here. These little tiny strands of fiberglass on the end, like that. And you use that to get rid of corrosion on your watches. Probably what works for clocks as well, uh, but it's brilliant, this thing works really well. So also helps get rid of corrosion on battery terminals too, if, you, if you're curious. But I, but I, sh I got, went down and polished the crap out of this um, and I didn't have to replace any jewels, which was nice. Um, but I had to get rid of all the corrosion that was everywhere. It looked terrible when I got it. So, so I just got, I got another week or so of work on it. And then I got to make a balance staff and the, the roller table is cracked. And I'm not sure whether I can actually make a roller table. I've never made a roller table, but I'm up for it. <laughs> so that's it. You're a better man than me, Gunga Din. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, I have a sort of a clock, uh, as a clock lamp actually that I picked up off eBay. This is from a company called Stenola, and then that's the back. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's it provides a uh, indirect lighting here, and it also lights up the uh, the electric clock. I think it dates from the 50s. And then I um, picked up a West Clox, about a 15 foot cord. And um, this is called the Ben Hur. It's, it's uh, West Clox. The, uh, there's an identical model that was made by West Clox in the United States called the Ben Franklin. Mm. So, so I guess it's a little get a bit of. Uh, Canadian chauvinism or, or whatever, so. Very cool. Anybody else? If not, we shall move on to the march. Oh, and I have one thing. Yep. I don't know if you can, I don't know if you, you can see this. 
I can't see it on my screen yet. Can you guys see it? Swiss yeah. on the dial, 17 Yeah, jewelry. so yeah. so what this is is a pull it back a bit. It's a it's a jewelry store counter ad. So it's clear plastic with it says for the for the best watch. I'm reading it backwards. <laughs> for the best watch value in any price or style. And then it says Swiss on the dial and 17 jewels in the movement. And it sits on this little wooden stand. And uh, it was a counter ad in a jewelry store, I think from the 40s or 50s. I found it in an antique store locally, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years ago. So mm -hmm. there, I, I've never seen another one. And as you know, I haunt antique stores and flea markets. This is the only one I've ever seen of it. So I'm kind of glad to have it. And there it is. That looks pretty cool. Very cool. Who made that, uh, Nick? Um, I, you know, I think it comes from the Swiss Federation. And I think it was back in the days when they were running all those magazine ads about getting Swiss watches and how you had to get your jeweler to look at them once every couple of years and so on. And they were just promoting Swiss watches as kind of, uh, you know, a, a gen generically uh, promoting all the brands at once. Um, I have a bunch of magazine ads as well from from those days, and they'd run them for Mother's Day and for Christmas and for graduation time, saying, you know, go and buy your your wife or your kid a, a Swiss watch, and talk about you know the quality of them and stuff. Kind of funky old ads. Uh, a lot of those seem to be in the late 1940s. So, interesting. Uh, make sure that people who have uh, uh, possibilities for presentations, we're looking for uh, people to do presentations for our upcoming meetings. So if you have any tools or if you have any layout to your workshops or clocks that you would like to talk about, please get in contact uh, with us with regards to, uh, with regards to presenting. I believe we shall move on now to uh, our presentation of items for sale. We have a number of items that are available and I'm just going to try to diminish, maybe if I go into, is this PowerPoint? Can, you, can, can people see the slides? Yeah, good, good. Uh, I'm just going to try to put it, I've got a lot of things, no, no, come on. Covering up my screen, so I'm just trying to, nope. You wanna get it into presentation mode. Maybe I can do it this way, slideshow, there we go. That's a bit better. Ta-da, Kevin West. I'm going to actually leave these for uh, the people who are selling them. To talk about them. So Kevin, if you would unmute yourself, uh, please let us know about uh, this item. Okay, this slave is not actually all that old. Hasn't been used uh, a lot. Uh, it's in very good shape. It's got quite a few uh, accessories. I'm I'm asking 600, but I'm open to good offers. Uh, just for example, the motor on it, if you're gonna buy that, that's a hundred. So accessories do add up. And if you want better photos of anything, just send me email and I can answer you. Take it away, Don. Not a problem. And you can see on the slide there if anybody's interested in the lathe. Uh, is it a lathe? It's not a, is it a watch lathe? What kind of lathe is it the size for? What's it designed for? It's designed for hobbyists and it's a good lathe for clocks. Yeah. Very. Sounds good. So we have uh, the name there. Uh, contact information, phone number, and an email address. Perfect. Next 
from Grant. I'm going to ask Grant to uh, get on the line. Nice. And he can talk. Hey, yeah, I'm here. Hi, everybody. Grant, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Good. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? We certainly can. Okay. Hey, how's everybody doing? Sorry, I don't have my uh, camera. In person, though. Uh, so, Don, I have a number of items, but uh, I think you have the pictures of them all there. So, if there's any questions or uh, any anything that uh, anybody wants to know, size or condition, uh, feel free to ask. But and you can contact me as well offline. Yeah. Did you want Did you want to talk about any of these particular items? I got one up on the screen at the moment. Your first one. Uh, which one is it, Don? Is it the uh, the time recorder? It is the Gilted Brooks Gilbert Glen Hill Brook time recorder. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's small. It's about uh, twelve inches long by about maybe I don't know ten inches uh, wide, and about uh, eight inches high. It's heavy. It's a really heavy movement. Um, it's an eight-day movement, English movement, and it actually works. The time recorder still works on it. This, it would need a new ribbon in it, but. Uh, it's a neat, uh, neat piece because it's a nice oak case on it, um, and it runs. It runs fine. And it looks like nicely polished. So that's that one. The next one is. Uh, I haven't done anything to it, but. Uh, oh, that's the pool hall clock, the yes. uh, calligraph or whatever. It's called. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that one's running too. Um, and uh, the two handles that you see on the side, I think, are probably to start and stop uh, the time. Um, and apparently they were used in pool halls mostly. So they also use them, I believe, for uh, timing long distance calls, but not in this configuration. So that's the Seth Thomas. It's a, uh, I can't remember the uh, the movement, but it's the uh, double spring movement. Uh, so it's time only. And it's heavy as well. It's probably about 25 pounds, maybe, that clock. You could double as a, cold, uh, as a boat anchor. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, boat anchor. <laughs> <laughs> Contact information is there again, as people can see on the left-hand side there for Grant. The next one is the Sessions 8-Day Shelf Clock. Uh, I'm looking here to see which one it was. Oh, that's the uh, the little cabinet clock. Yeah, it's a nice little clock. It's, uh, there's one piece that's cracked at the top. I circled it with red, uh, but it hasn't been glued or anything. So um, sometimes when, you know, when people don't repair them well, you can't actually fix them so that they can't be seen. But... Uh, <laughs> This one hasn't been glued, so if it was glued and clamped, it would be fine. It runs. Yeah, it's fine. It hasn't been overhauled or anything. It was just one that I picked up probably 10 years ago. Uh, it's got original glass on it and everything, so it's time and strike eight day. And then the small New Haven banjo clock. Uh, yep, that's just a, uh, well, like it's, it's a platform escapement New Haven. Uh, the Eagle has a broken wing on it. Uh, it runs fine as well. It's an eight day. Also, it's probably, I'm going to say 12, 14 inches uh, in height. Um, but uh, it, it works fine. Uh, I'm not sure how well it keeps time. It probably needs to be cleaned as well. And then I think the last one probably, Don, is the uh, Johans. Yes. Um, so just trying yeah. to figure out how to pronounce that. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I may not have gotten it right either. But anyways, it's a... Uh, <laughs> Westminster chime, it's got a really nice sounding chime as most of the German clocks do. It's heavy, uh, but the cabinet needs some uh, cleaning up. Uh, the movement looks really clean. I haven't had it running because it uh, didn't have the pendulum on it when I got it either, but uh, it's uh, it's nice and clean despite the uh, the case that looks uh, worn, but uh, should, should clean up nicely. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Eh? I think that's the only ones I gave you. Okay, and uh, does it have the pendulum now? It doesn't, but I have, I'm sure I have one here. Okay. It does, but the original pendulum wasn't worth it. No. Right. Okay. So we have the contact information there. If you, uh, on any of those items, yeah. uh, please uh, feel free to get back to the grant. Thanks, Don. Not a problem. Now we're on to Gary. I'm going to ask Gary to uh, start talking through some of uh, the items he has. Unmute yourself. Yeah, this is a, a very early Elgin pocket watch. Um, it runs, it's key wine, key set. 
The serial number is quite low. It's 46,000, so it's circa 1870. It's a nickel case. Um, it uh, winds, sets, and runs, but it could do with a cleaning. So $75, you got my email address, and I can deliver it to you. Uh, that National Watch Company is what uh, they originally called the company, and that's what's on the dial. Now, Gary, you do realize that some of our memberships are out in the maritime, so you're still going to deliver them? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if it's outside of the uh, sort of National Capital Region, we'll have to mail it at their cost. Ah, that's reasonable. Next one, the Hamilton 4992. 4992B, um, it is um, quite well known, a sweep secondhand 24 hour dial. Dial uh, mostly used in the American Armed Forces. Uh, this one dates to 1944 based on the serial number. I don't know that the case is original. I think it's a replacement case. It's, it's original to that movement but uh, they probably had a movement with um, US government or armed forces markings on it, which was replaced. So the case is pristine. Uh, these things are offered for sale uh, on the internet, uh, on eBay for over a thousand bucks. But quite frankly, I, I don't think they're worth that much. Um, I'm charging 300 because you'll need to get it cleaned and with the sweep second hand and everything else, it'll probably um, uh, cost you a bit of money, uh, but still much less than the thousand dollars that crazies are asking for it. Um, so a nice watch runs. Um, there it is. Any questions, let me know. And the next one. Uh, this one is um, a rather unusual one. Um, it's a very early uh, Swiss watch. Um, the name is barely legible at the bottom of the dial. It's Mayrat and Langel in Saint Imier, if that's how you pronounce it, in Switzerland. Um, Mayrat himself um, opened his business pre 1800, and his son Francois took over and called it something else. Um, and ultimately the business was sold and it wound up uh, becoming part of the, uh, I believe the, um, oh, Maynard's favorite company, Longines, there we go. Um, so this, uh, this watch probably dates to the early 1800s. It's key wine, key set. Uh, again, it runs, but it could do with the cleaning. It's um, a cylinder statement. Hmm. And the Whitman. Uh, this is a, an English watch. Um, the name on the movement is Whiteman. Uh, there's a gajillion Whitemans listed in London and other parts of England. Uh, the only way you could narrow this particular one down is based on the, uh, the hallmark, which uh, takes it to about 1815. Now the Outer case, it's a pair case watch. The outer case is uh, someone's put another one in there. They've got, if I recall, it's a, a Chester outer case. Uh, it fits, except it's a little bit deeper, but otherwise it's snug around the movement. Um, the serial number is uh, pointed out there, 2722. Uh, the reason I'm reasonably confident in the date, the U, because it's pretty hard to decipher some of those hallmarks, is that the case maker is WBCH, which you see between the uh, leopard head and the, uh, and the U. Um, that business, uh, that company started in business making cases in London in 1812. So um, that's why I think this really does date to about 1815. Again, it runs, could do with the cleaning. Simon. Yes. yes. Uh, thank you, Don. Um, yeah, 
Well, pretty much as the description uh, is written there, I have some sets of brand new weight shells. They're still in their paper wrappers and in their original boxes. Uh, I've got five sets and everything's there, the end caps, the, the hooks, the end buttons, um, and the rods. Uh, not the weights, just the shells. Right. So I'm asking $80, $80 per set. Oh, and they're, they're 250 millimeters by 51 millimeters. No, it, I didn't have an email address or anything oh, on there. Sorry, I can dictate that to you now if you wish. Yep, people get yeah. that. Uh, Gary and uh, Paul could write it down just in case people have uh, questions too. But if you could do that, you can. Yeah, it, so it's now. Simon, S I M O N, dot. Davies, D A V I E S, dot M T S. That's M for mother, T for Tommy, S for sugar, at gmail.com. Yeah. So I'm Perfect. Davies, M T S. Yeah, there's a dot after Davies. Right. Two dots in my email address. Yeah, so, uh, so these are brand new moon phase dials. Um, and the important detail here, I guess, is the post spacing so that you, so that it, uh, you know, where they fit onto the front plate, 115 millimeters center to center by 92 millimeter center to center. Um, I've got three of these. And, and they are they are brand new. Okay, dope. Now is this probably the same one or is this a different one? This is a a sailing ship. No, this is so these I've got two uh, of a different kind of moon phase dial. Um, this one has got a different post spacing, one hundred ten millimeters by ninety eight millimeters, and. Uh, so they've ne basically never been out of their polystyrene box, apart from just inspection. Um, one of them, one of them, still in its original paper wrapper. And so the, I have you just got the one picture, Don? Uh, so okay. if it's just the one picture. No, I, I got. Uh, I just moved down, oh. and I got one with the deer on top. Yeah. So that's that's the other the other side of the moon phase dial. So it's got the deer. By the by the river for the yep. one and then it's the sailing ship for the other oh okay so i've got two of those sorry so you go ahead yep keep going yeah two of i've got two of those again brand new and, and i think i think that's everything yeah that's the close-up yeah. of the sailboat again there you go yeah yeah but then that Go getting close to the uh, the end of our meeting here. We have the what am I? And if anybody was reading the the Gary's newsletter, there was a post or or, or a entry uh, made from Alan Simmons. It's the first clue. And anybody who can uh, think of what it was that I'm. Uh, talking about just let, let me know uh, speak up uh, the other thing is uh, he had a series of cartoons presenting and the kind of clock that I'm thinking of was associated with something that was really irritating sundial no, <laughs> I mean the sun coming up. No, um, and, but but we're referenced uh, very clearly from a Dagwood and Blondie cartoon. Alarm, Alarm. Alarm. Yes, well done. Who said that? Uh, uh, it's one of the people, uh, Dave Rudeau. Okay, good. Well done, you. Yeah, the. Uh, I, I remember having, uh, I don't know if people have it now anymore, but uh, like the ticking alarm clock sitting right beside the, 
the bed and I'm surprised at what you can get used to. I think probably now that constant ticking right by your ear could drive you insane. But uh, back then it was very so common that you never even thought about it. And then of course at some horrendous hour in the morning it would scream at you that really harsh uh, dinging so sound. But uh, I, I, uh, I remember those alarm clocks very well. For those of you who enjoyed the cartoons, I've got good news for those who hated them, bad news. I've already submitted another set of cartoons for my column in March, and Gary has the file already. So <laughs> be ready to smile or scream, whatever. Excellent. Thank you very much for those. I always enjoy the cartoons. Um, any last comments from anybody on uh, online? We had 29. So Gary... Uh, and Paul, if uh, you wanted to make our reference, 29 was our maximum number of people. We have 28 now. Just, uh, just one little comment about alarm clocks. When I was a young lad, just out of school, I worked on a transmitting station that uh, transmitted a navigation signal. And the worst thing that could possibly happen was going off the air. And there was a bell, like an alarm clock, that rang when you were off the air. And my biggest fear was hearing that bell, you know, and for years afterwards, I couldn't stand any bell or any alarm clock near me at all. It was like the world, the world was ending if I heard that. Exactly, yes. Now, back then, were those smoke signals you were sending off? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't, you're, you're muted. You're a cruel, cruel man, Don. I, it, it was a navigation system for ships, mostly trawlers in the North Sea. Yeah. And uh, we sent out the signal that they navigated on. So if we stopped or we sent a wrong signal, they were on the rocks. Right. No, just I was being uh, uh, rude and saying, were they smoke signals? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, no comment. <laughs> Good. Our... Uh, our next meeting is the fourth Sunday in March, which is March 27th. 